Whether you're a sun worshipper or prefer to hide in the shade, there's no denying the potential of solar. To power the developing world and beyond, charge our electronic devices and much, much more in an affordable and sustainable way. When you think of solar energy startups, you probably picture millennials running around Silicon Valley. In this episode of Sustainable Energy, coming to you from a solar farm in the beautiful southeast of England, we look into the horizon at a diverse range of solar energy startups working towards a sunny future and shed light on how they plan to make that happen. Coming up. We meet the leading ladies of solar energy in India. Then we plug into the potential of indoor light before we get a glimpse of the weather forecast of the future. Plus, Upendra Tripathi, the Director General of the International Solar Alliance, flew from India to England and he answers our solar questions. But first, let's put the spotlight on some facts and figures. In 2016, the total amount of electricity generated by renewables was just over 5,800 terawatt hours, which was approximately 24% of the total global electricity production. Solar energy accounted for 6% of the electricity produced from renewables. There was a 31% increase in solar power generation between 2015 and 2016. Between 2009 and 2017, the price of solar panels per watt declined by 75%. Over a billion people in rural parts of the developing world are living in energy poverty with no electricity. In Jaipur, India, rural women are the beacons of light, offering hope of a brighter future. Frontier Markets recruits women living in rural parts of India to act as solar sahilis or solar friends, selling solar energy products to their neighbours. They walk to nearby villages to spread the word on the benefits of solar energy, demonstrate how the products work and persuade co-reliant communities to invest in solar-powered solutions instead. The company's main mission is to create Saral Javin, or an easy life for rural customers. One thing we need to understand about rural customers or rural households is their life is extremely challenging. They don't have access to infrastructure, they don't have access to electricity, they don't have access to water, they have health crises. Every day their life is challenging, but they always have a smile. So when we look at the concept of what we want to do and how we want to respect them, we believe that we're here to ease their life by the services that we offer or settle Jivan. So one thing that we really believe is that if I want to address the challenges in your life, my goal is to just make your life a bit easier. Since Frontier Markets was founded in 2011, it has built up a network of 5,000 female entrepreneurs who are fully trained in marketing and in the technology so that they can teach their customers how to use the products. When I approach a new customer, I explain the benefits of all our products to them. Sometimes people understand immediately. They know about Frontier Markets and the work we do. But if it's a new customer who doesn't know about us, I demonstrate all the products to them. The first challenge for the solar Sahilis is to convince their neighbours that solar is a reliable source of energy and to shake off scepticism that comes after a prevalence of poor quality solar products in India over the last two decades. Solar, solar Rakshak Plus is our most popular product. It is mostly used for farming activity. It has a good range of almost one kilometre. It is a very sturdy product. It is known to perform without any problems for over two years. You can even charge your phone. That's one reason for its high sales. It has a lot of demand in rural India. That's what I sell the most. One of the many benefits of selling to people they know and who live within walking distance is that they can offer repairs and technical advice in a full after-sales service, something most regular shops in rural India would not provide. Our emphasis on Solar Sahilis came when we recognized that if you truly want to work on behavior change and help rural households connect with the emotional challenges that they face, women are perfect at that. We found an opportunity to really bring women into the value chain in a way that did not exist before. We also learned that 70% of our users were women. So when you're understanding the burden of electricity and you're starting to think about who's the best to connect with that, it became women. 
So this unique startup is shining light on the power of rural women who fully understand the needs of their customers. They can vouch for the transformative effect of clean, affordable solar energy on quality of life, education and the environment. And so the positive butterfly effect is spreading light step by step, village by village, and perhaps one day state by state and even nation by nation. Upendra Tripathi is Director General of the International Solar Alliance. Prior to this, he was Secretary of the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy for the Government of India. Upendra is an Indian Administrative Service Officer with more than 36 years of public service in various departments. Well, first of all, Mr. Tripathi, thank you for your time. I know you're a very, very busy man. You've come here from India to England for this Green Grids Connecting Asia conference. Can you give us an idea about what this is? Oh, thank you for the uh, opportunity. In fact, uh, uh, in this conference, we have members of parliament from different uh, countries. We have experts, we have uh, industry people. And uh, ISA also believes that uh, there should be one uh, grid, uh, one world, and one sun. And this is a sort of corollary thing where we discuss the details to go forward. You mentioned the ISA, the International Solar Alliance, of which you're the Director General. Can you give us a very broad mission of what the organisation stands for? Well, uh, International Solar Alliance is a treaty-based organization. Uh, as of now, 74 countries have signed the treaty. 50 countries have ratified. So it's an international institution. In simple, what we try is that by 2030, we would like up to rather more than $1,000 billion to be invested in member countries to promote solar applications so that universal energy access uh, issues are addressed, uh, Paris Agreement issues are addressed, Essentially, the SDG 7 uh, you know, is promoted. Can you tell us what is it that the ISA hopes to achieve over the next decade? ISA believes that there are 1.2 billion people without access to electricity and there are around 2.4 billion people without uh, access to clean uh, cooking medium. Uh, and uh, they're mostly women. So ISA believes that with the help of solar energy and the tools and techniques that are available, by 2000. Uh, 25 even, the universal energy access should be possible. What can be done to ensure that people all over the world can access reliable and affordable solar energy? Well, number one, uh, we should make appropriate technologies available uh, in the context of uh, the people who need them and where they uh, do need these technologies. And number two, which is more important, is uh, aggregation of demand, risk and resources. When I say aggregation of demand, I'll give you one example. For example, in India, they bought 320 million LED bulbs all over the country. As a result, the prices went down by 80%. Now, if we can aggregate demand for water pumps, street lights, home lighting systems, uh, solar pumps in a global scale, and then also aggregate risk associated with that and make those projects bankable, that brings in accessibility to affordable solar energy. What's the potential for upscaling the work of programs like the Solar Sahelis from a village level to a much more macro scale? Uh, if you think the total number of uh, you know, people, the families, those who don't have access to electricity and the type of solar goods and services that can be marketed, uh, these agencies or institutions can actually create a new market, a potential market of uh, a billion people who like to consume more solar goods and services because they can be appropriated there, they can be supplied uh, there. So, uh, and they can also bring in new technologies uh, in this place and it creates employment. It is something the, something the society likes because they bring in investment, they create employment, they empower the women and they, at the same time they meet a desired end uh, and a demand uh, for, 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 for the poor. After the break, we step into the shade to get a glimmer of the potential of indoor light. When you think of generating solar energy, you imagine the source to be bright outdoor light. But in Jerusalem, there's an innovative startup turning solar inside out. An industrial estate in Jerusalem may be a far cry from the heady hub of startups in Silicon Valley, but 3G Solar is rethinking silicon altogether. It has invented tiny innovative solar panels, which can be implanted onto electronic devices, enabling them to generate their own power in a sustainable way. Unlike regular silicon cells that work outside, these solar panels are designed specifically for indoor and low light, where most electrical appliances are kept and used. 
Our product is a kind of energy device that can replace a conventional battery and remove the need for ever having to replace or recharge that battery in the lifetime of the device. 3G Solar's products come in a variety of sizes and colours. The main focus is on powering smart home devices, including sensors that transmit information about light and humidity to thermostats that regulate heating and air conditioning. Tapping into the trend to digitise smart home devices in order to increase energy efficiency. Here you see in the middle of the device the 3G solar dye cell which provides the power for the, inside the device. And basically um, the information in the room is broadcast to um, some sort of device like a tablet or it could be a cell phone. Uh, and that information is logged all the time during the day and night which the system is operating. The manufacturing process has been carefully honed here at the company's small facility, but it has plans to expand and produce millions of these small PV cells by 2020. Looking at the way that wireless devices have come up and what is now known as the Internet of Things, billions of wireless devices being run by cable or by batteries, we said with this technology, which is both low cost and high performance at low light levels and especially indoors. It works so well indoors in the spectrum of LED light that we have a solution to power these devices that no one else can offer. While solar energy has traditionally been perceived as an expensive form of renewable energy, 3G Solar is keen to point out that its technology is affordable, saying that by fitting one of its cells to a device, the overall cost would increase by around $1. Billions of batteries are being thrown away each year and we provide the solution to that waste. No more throwing of batteries, disposing of batteries, no batteries. You put the PV cell into the sensor device and it runs for the lifetime of that sensor. So by bringing solar energy indoors where we keep most of our electronic gadgets, 3G Solar's innovation has the potential to clean up the way we charge and power our devices, whether they're connected to the internet or not. Time will tell if the sun will shine on this invention and beam it into the mainstream. Let's think about the future. Can you ever envisage a situation where all our electric devices are powered by solar, where maybe solar energy replaces more traditional forms of storage or energy? Oh, well, of course, I'm very optimistic. In fact, that is what uh, ISA is supposed to lead us to. And look at my words. I mean, this is solar, and uh, all appliances can be even uh, DC appliances. But uh, in a bigger way, we're looking at two things. You know, one at grassroots level, solar goods and services can be made available so that, you know, most of the appliances can run with solar energy directly linked to solar panels. And the other thing we're talking about, mass uh, generation of uh, electricity at utility scale, combining both PV and heat so that uh, uh, at times when the sun is not there, we, we run things with the electricity generated from the heat stored uh, during the daytime. What sort of technology, what exciting inventions should we be looking out for when we're thinking about using solar energy inside our homes? See, the most exciting thing that is uh, happening is in the R&D front in solar. You know, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, very highly efficient uh, second generation, third generation PV panels. We are also talking about use of, uh, you know, nanoparticles. We are using uh, the 3D technology, printing technology. So a whole lot of new, exciting things are happening over there. Uh, even in the storage front, the way the costs are coming down, not only due to management improvements, but also due to, you know, use of uh, different types of materials. How important is technological innovation to ISIS vision? Technological innovations are very critical for ISIS future and uh, for universal energy access because, uh, number one, technology determines the cost of uh, solar energy, and uh, number two, uh, uh, the technologies also are very critical in terms of uh, amplifying the application of solar energy. So for these reasons, the scale and the skill that we talked about earlier, we talked about earlier, uh, you find technology is very critical, and that's why we are creating a platform of uh, even technology in the public domain where member countries can access. Technological innovation is so important when we think about the future 
of solar energy. What is it that ISA does to help support the development of that? Well, uh, we do understand that uh, technological innovation is very crucial. So we have set up a number of task forces where we can involve the research community, the different organizations, industry. For example, there is a task force on innovation and global leadership. There is a task force of foundations. There is a task force of chambers of commerce and industry. So we involve all these agencies, you know, to find out what type of technologies are available out there. And also to promote, uh, you know, we establish solar awards uh, uh, to find the best scientists whom we can give some award uh, in terms of uh, R&D. We also have a network called Infopedia where we connect all the R&D organizations in the member countries who can share information, identify critical areas where research is required. And we also tie up with other R&D agencies of member countries. So a whole lot of strategy we put in place to see that, you know, we meet our R&D requirements uh, of ISA in the, among the member countries and which would be the focus areas. Also to incentivize research and development, we have uh, institution of awards. Well, R&D is a crucial part when we think about our solar energy future. But if you thought you already knew about your solar energy future, here's one common misconception. You thought you knew? Think again. Myth. Solar panels will not work in a cold, cloudy climate. Fact. Solar panels can still generate power on cold, cloudy days as it's the radiation from the sun rather than the temperature and heat that provides photovoltaic generation. For optimal solar panel output, a clear, bright day is the ideal weather as the panels then receive the most light. However, even on cloudy days, panels can potentially produce up to a third of their maximum output, though estimates vary. Wind and rain can also benefit solar panel output by cleaning off any debris. Conversely, extremely hot climates can cause solar panels to overheat and become inefficient, in the same way as our electrical devices overheat in hot weather. After the break, we check the weather forecast to see if we can catch some rays. One common criticism of solar energy is that it's hard to predict and manage. In Reunion, there's an exciting startup working around that by shining light on forecasting solutions. Under the beating sun of the Indian Ocean, Reuniwat has developed cutting edge technology to help forecast solar energy in the foreseeable future. As solar developed very fast in Reunion Island, the grid electricity operator was worried about potential impact on the grid stability. The grid operator decided not to connect any longer solar farms to the grid. Something had to be done in order to enable a safe and massive penetration of photovoltaics on the grid. Solar forecasting is the simplest, cheapest way to mitigate the risk. According to the company, its products give an accurate forecast of the volume of energy solar plants will produce in the minutes, hours and days ahead. This allows customers to manage the energy they produce effectively, increase their trading revenue and give a reliable estimate of how much solar energy they can supply to the grid. In order to measure then forecast uh, solar energy, Reuniwatt uses a multitude of data sources, uh, satellite observation, weather models, uh, ground sensors measurements and sky images. I designed the pipelines to collect um, clean, aggregate and uh, share the data with the rest of the team. And the goal is to make sure that the forecasts that we send to our clients are always the most accurate. Reuniwatt's first ever customer was Albioma, an independent power producer which installed the product on the roof of a local supermarket in St. Lou in 2014, where it shines brightly to this day. We are serving here Albioma, our pioneering customer, located on the rooftop of a supermarket. Here is our patenting imaging system. Camera, which is not a standard one, but an infrared, is looking downwards on the mirror, catching all the sky. We are collecting cloud temperature, which is linked to the cloud altitude. Then we can construct a 3D map of the cloud cover. The company now operates worldwide, mainly selling data to countries such as Australia, French Guyana, Israel and Brazil. The weather conditions and rich natural environment of Reunion lend themselves to renewable energy, especially solar, marine, wind and biomass, and the island is aiming to attain energy autonomy by 2030. 
The prospect of affordable and predictable solar energy is certainly appealing, but it remains to be seen if forecasting technology will take off in countries where the weather lends itself less to generating solar energy. Benefits of solar forecasting is simple. Electrical grid must be balanced at all times. Production must take all consumption. Opponents of solar call it intermittent. When a cloud comes in, production will drop. Without forecasting, you must run it all full-time a thermal unit in order to guarantee proper balance of the grid, inducing hidden costs. Thanks to forecasting, you fire the thermal unit only when necessary, reducing operation costs, improving carbon impact. So checking the traditional weather forecast may become a thing of the past, with future generations chasing the sun to predict their solar energy needs. For now though, one thing is certain, the sun is shining on this particular renewable energy in Reunion. Now skeptics will say that solar power is unreliable, unpredictable and costly. What do you say to them? Well definitely it's not costly anymore, in most countries you'll find it has uh, attained the grid parity and the costs are progressively coming down. Now so far as reliability is concerned and you know, uh, uh, you will find that it is becoming more and more reliable and with the type of storage uh, technology that is coming in, this will not be an issue in the future. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the market for solar energy forecasting. Well, you see, the global market uh, in solar gets around $150 billion of uh, investment every year. As the market expands, you know, the demand for reliability, for scheduling power uh, becomes more and more important. And that is required for grid stability, that is required for grid maintenance. Uh, in view of this, uh, all the players in the market, you know, they have a very bright future. And uh, I'm sure the technologies involved are improving over time. And uh, even the, now the forecasting is becoming more accurate and with less margin of uh, error. In your opinion, is it feasible that solar energy could become the major source of energy in the developing world? Well, that was the original objective of ISA. That's why the membership was limited to the members' uh, countries within the tropics. Now it has been amended. Now any UN member country you know, can be a member uh, in the future uh, ISA. Uh, because uh, quite a few countries uh, developing or even, you know, uh, L, uh, least developed countries will find that solar, solar rich resource countries. And uh, the moment we are talking about tapping more solar energy at a less, lesser cost, these are going to be very important for these countries. And uh, given that uh, we can combine different types of uh, solar technologies of heat and uh, light and other things, I'm sure that uh, one day these countries can look after themselves and make, through affordable solar energy. Can you talk to us a little bit about the relationship between ISA and other international organisations like the UN or the World Bank, for example? Well, uh, you know, in the framework agreement of ISA, you find that uh, United Nations and its organs are our strategic partners. And uh, recently, one US, U, uh, UN mission has visited us. So, and that apart, uh, we have MOUs, or uh, Memorandum of Understanding with World Bank, uh, with uh, many other multilateral organisations. Uh, we are also close to IRENA and uh, REN21. Uh, we feel that together, actually, we can bring the world a better place, a greener place and a cleaner place. <laughs> now, I always like to end these interviews, Mr. Party, by thinking about your vision for the next 20 years, 50 years. What will this country look like? What will India look like? What will the world look like? Well, uh, in 25, 50 years, my vision is very clear. The world will be a much better place, much cleaner and greener place, because I believe that mankind uh, you know, has innate ability to tackle such problems and we have tackled in the past like ozone crisis and all that so I have a very bright view of the future of India, of uh, England, of uh, the world in general, uh, of mankind uh, in general. It's going to a much better place so you need not be pessimistic about it. That's a wonderfully positive way to end our interview. Mr. Thank Buddy, you. thank you so much. Thank it's you. been an honour and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Such a pleasure. So, thanks to a diverse and innovative solar energy startup scene, we could soon see the sun go down on energy poverty in rural areas in the developing world, but rise brightly just in time to charge our electrical devices, and all in a predictable way, thanks to Spot On Forecasting. Next time, we have an energy storage special in store for you. We meet industry pioneers harnessing valuable renewable energy. And you can join our discussion. If you have any burning questions, get them to us on Twitter, at CNBC Energy, using the hashtags Ask SE and Sustainable Energy. But until next time, keep thinking green. Goodbye. Goodbye.